Hello and welcome. Thank you for connecting with us today. I'm so grateful for the privilege of welcoming you to my back porch to have some time together to do some talk about some God stuff. We'll be celebrating Holy Communion today. Anyone can participate. All you need is a piece of bread, a cookie, a cracker, and something to drink. So if you haven't done that already, you can pause the video and get what you need. Now let's begin our time together with these responsive gathering words. Please join me in this responsive call to worship. People of God, let your faces shine with the joy of a new day. For in our faces the light of God's love shines forth. People of God, lay the struggles of the weak aside, but do not deny them. For it can be through our struggles that God is revealed to us most deeply. People of God, let us join together in worship, for it is in worship that God can know our hearts and minds. People of God, let us raise our voices in word and prayer, for it is through our voices that the song of God is heard. Let us pray, sharing our confession with God. Holy One, we confess that we do not always recognize your presence with us. We see struggle and sadness in the eyes of those who suffer, and we do not notice that this is you. We hear grief and anguish in the words of the oppressed and do not notice that this is you. We join in conversation with those who tell stories of deep distress, and we do not notice that this is you. We shut our doors and windows when the smells and odors of death and decay threaten our peaceful existence, and we do not notice that this is you. Even in this prayer, we are asked to imagine that you are more expansive than we have thought before, and we do not recognize you. Forgive us, and turn our hearts toward embracing all of who you are, all of how you reveal yourself in this world. Forgive us and reveal yourself again and again, we pray. Amen. Now hear these affirming words. The good news is that even without our notice, recognition or understanding, God is God in all and always. We are closer than we can know, and we are loved more than we can imagine. We are forgiven before we even ask. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's Old Testament story is the story of Joseph. Um, and if you remember, he is a dreamer. He has dreams and later in life interprets dreams. But today's story focuses on when he is still a boy at home working with his brothers. 
he shares some of his dreams and they become angry and jealous with him. Um, and, and, and as a result, they sell him into slavery. Yuji Morales is a dreamer as well. She came to the United States from Mexico where she was born and raised with her son in 1994. And she wrote this book, Dreamer. And I wanna, I wanna share the first little bit with you. I dreamed of you, then you appeared. Together we became a more love a more resplendent life, you and I. One day we bundled gifts in our backpack and crossed a bridge outstretched like the universe. And when we made it to the other side, thirsty, in awe, unable to go back, we became immigrants. So Joseph's exceptional work to fulfill God's dream began when he was sold into slavery and taken to Egypt. Yuji's work of sharing stories began when she came to the United States and she and her son discovered libraries. Joseph and Yuji and each of us have dreams both in our sleep and our life streams. And often we dream those dreams in the dark. And so I would like our prayer today to be in the dark so that we can just be quiet and in ourselves reflectively. And so let us pray. Dreamer God, we pray Thanks be to God. Amen. Our scripture passage today follows on from the feeding of the 5,000 that was last week. And before that, you may remember, Jesus has heard that his cousin and forerunner John the Baptist has been executed. It is written in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Listen, the word of God comes to us. Let us pay attention. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, 
he became frightened and beginning to sink he cried out save me Jesus Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him saying to him you of little faith why did you doubt when they got into the boat the wind ceased and those in the boat worshipped him saying truly you are God's own If you say go, we will go. If you say wait, we will wait. If you say step out on the water and they say it can't be done, we'll fix our eyes on you. to no surprise to my spouse that I'm somewhat of an introvert. I need to spend time by myself to renew and reflect. I'm also somewhat of an extrovert who loves to do ministry with people, talk ministry with my colleagues, and generally be in the middle of justice work. There are times when these two parts of me get along just fine, and then there are times when there are conflicting needs. I wonder, if Jesus ever felt that way. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 comes just before today's verses when we hear that Jesus sent the disciples away, sent them across the sea on their own while he retreated to the mountaintop for some renewal time with God. It's not long before there's a storm that rocks the disciples' boat. There are some really powerful images here that reflect the dimensions of God's call on our lives as well as God's presence. There's the image of Jesus taking time away from the crowds and the disciples to pray as a reminder that things are never so turbulent or urgent as to take us away from the necessity of prayer or just simply time with God. There's the image of Jesus sending out the disciples on a mission, just as we're sent out into our communities to do God's work. The image of choppy seas that offers the reality that when we encounter troubled water in our lives, God does not abandon us, but comes to meet us wherever we are. The image of the disciples so enmeshed in their fear that they don't recognize Jesus coming to them on the water and then their confession of faith that God is right there in the midst of the waters of their terror. 
Each of these images offer both comfort and conviction. In the midst of our fearful reality of life during a pandemic, we may struggle to trust that God is really with us in the midst of all the chaos. And yet, even when we don't recognize God, God calls on us to take heart and affirms our human need to reach out to God for assurance of God's presence. God does not disappoint. Jesus assured the disciples all those centuries ago, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then there's Peter. The Gospel according to Matthew is the only one of the four that includes Peter wanting Jesus to help him walk out on the water. What is Matthew trying to tell us here? To the ancients, the sea was a place on earth which was a source of demonic forces and disruption. Bad stuff can happen during storms when you're just out there bobbing about in a tiny boat in a large chaotic sea. As soon as Jesus speaks to them, Peter asks for something so characteristic of Jesus' favorite and first disciple. If it's really you, command me to come to you on the water, Peter says. In other words, prove it. Peter is brash and passionate, always rushing into things, saying out loud what others are secretly wondering and doing what the other disciples don't dare. When Jesus hikes to the Mount of Transfiguration, it's Peter who blurts out, hey, let's build some tents and live in this miracle moment for a while. It's Peter who asks Jesus to explain his parables, who answers Jesus' questions first, who understands Jesus' true identity, but fails to understand what it will cost him. It's Peter who swears he'll never deny knowing Jesus, and Peter who does. Peter falls asleep at Gethsemane and now sinks in the churning water just as Jesus reaches out to him. It's not hard to love Peter because he so gallantly takes risks and stumbles, but just gets back up and brushes himself off and tries again. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote, and I quote, Peter is not a fake. Through all his up and ups and downs and his great moments and his awful one, Peter's heart is on his sleeve. What you see is what you get with him, an impetuous, outspoken man who both loves Jesus and lets him down, who richly deserves Jesus' judgment, but who also receives his grace." End quote. It doesn't feel too out of character that Peter asked Jesus to identify himself by helping Peter walk on the water. I can just imagine the disciples dripping wet and shivering when Peter dared to swing his legs over the side of the rocking boat to risk his life on the dangerous water with Jesus approaching and, and then reaching out in love. As if taking his very first childlike tentative steps he does just fine until a gust of wind toppled his courage, awakened his fear, erased his trust. He started to sink into the darkness. Whether it's learning to ride a bike for the first time or feeling the wind blow in your hair and the scenery flies by, or while trying to step out from wet rock to wet rock to cross a rushing creek, or maybe you're delivering a speech in front of a big crowd, you can lose your nerve, your foot can slip, or panic takes hold. Doubt can take hold like that to distract us with uncertainty. Doubt can whittle away at trust like the disintegration of wood exposed to all sorts of weather. Doubt can sprout roots like so many weeds of fear and anxiety that can bear no fruits of hope. And yet, Peter didn't sink. He asked Jesus to save him. Sure, it might have been a storybook ending if Peter had stayed upright on the water, but then we wouldn't know what happens when we ask for God's help. This brings to mind a turning point in my teenage years when I was having trouble with my horse. 
He was a five-year-old Arabian, only recently gelded, which made him full of testosterone-fueled energy. He scared me. My riding instructor and our farrier showed me how to get his attention, which included it kicking him in the diaphragm. I know it sounds harsh, but it's a place where I could do no harm, but surprise him into paying attention to this hundred pound girl. My introverted side kicked in when I stayed home from school one day, feeling sick at heart with my dilemma and my fear. I remember clearly asking God to help me figure out this horse that I really loved, who clearly needed my training and who frightened me deeply. During that stay home, I felt a shift from timid passivity to a willingness to try, and I tried many times, to assert my personal power toward my horse. This didn't mean that I would harm him or abuse him in any way, but just by my change of attitude, my horse learned to respect me. Our mutual respect for each other then became deep devotion to our relationship, which lasted nearly 15 years. It was also the basis for my interest in becoming a certified therapeutic horseback riding instructor. As I was thinking about Holy Communion today, I read a story by Carter Hayward, a professor of theology at Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Like me, Dr. Hayward had an interest in therapeutic horseback riding. And as she talked with a former divinity student about her dream of opening a therapeutic riding center, this student shared the insight that the horse is the priest. Now, what is she talking about? Well, in other words, during the horse and rider interaction, especially in a therapeutic situation, they share this mutuality of restorative power, similar to the holy interaction between a priest or pastor and the congregation. Riding a horse can be a terrifying experience as well as an empowering one. For those with limited abilities, such as autism or cerebral palsy, the movement of the horse's back stimulates the spinal cord, relaxes stiff muscles, and empowers the rider with confidence. Dr. Hayward sees a similarity between the rider empowered by the horse and taking Holy Communion. She wrote, quote, like all who share in the Holy Eucharist, this empowered relationship represents all humans and other creatures who need to draw our strength, our sacred power from struggling for right, justice-making, compassionate connectedness with one another. This right relation is forged through our willingness, following Jesus, to give up our spiritually ignorant claims to autonomy and independence in order to be there for one another in an authentic, authentically holy communion, a sacred community. To build such a community like the creative relational connectedness between a horse and rider, she wrote, always generates sacred space in which miracles can happen, end quote. Like Peter, taking the risk of stepping into churning water in the darkness of early morning. Perhaps the awakening of his fear reminds us of our own vulnerability, not weakness. Perhaps the miracle here is our awareness of our need for God, our need for communion, connection with God, not just when life gets threatening or when we need to retreat to care for our introvert, or just when we take communion and eat with each other, but in all times and situations. May it be so. Thanks be to God. And now as we do each week, let us hold each other and the world in prayer. O oh God, 
We have longed to see you face to face. And we thank you that we have done so. And not only survived, but have been enriched, strengthened, guided and gifted by every encounter with you. For we have seen your face in generous smiles, an open welcome we have received. We have seen your face in the ideas of grace shared, hope imagined, and moments of communion dreamed. We have seen your face as we, as we have struggled to understand our lives and experiences. We have seen your face in our desire to be in deeper communion with you and your realm. O oh God, mindful of our deep need for your mysterious and transformative presence, we lift up in prayer families around the world who've lost loved ones to coronavirus or violence. From unabated fear, neglect, or ignorance, at the hands of a supposed protector or the hands of a neighbor. Surround them, O oh God, with the assurance of your powerful and peaceful presence. We pray for people of color and indigenous communities hit hardest by COVID-19, climate change, and pollution. And we hold close to our hearts, those in our faith community. O oh God, Shine the light of your love on the families grieving the deaths of loved ones. On Anne recovering from a hospital stay. On Gretchen recovering from a back injury. On Dolores, Carol, Bill, Faye, Shirley, Joan, Lance, Barbara, Betty Jean, dawn and all whom we love as we open our hearts in prayer may they recognize your presence with them along the way may all who lead and have the power to influence do so reflecting your face and beauty trusting that god has lived and loved on the earth and knows the pain and struggles of our humanness will you join me in the lord's prayer as you know it, or as shown here. Our Creator, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us gather at the table, at your table, around our each other's tables in this act of holy communion. In our life together as a community, we live amidst a web of arrivals and departures. Today, we mark this constant coming and going as we take time to ground ourselves here in this moment, in this place, around this table and all of our tables. We come knowing that these ordinary elements represent extraordinary opportunities to meet God. In the simplicity of this bread, in the simplicity of this cup, we enter into the depths of God's covenant with us. The beauty of our shared sacramental life is found here. We know that what we do here today is of utmost importance to God. This matters. Each of us matter. We together matter. And through this, we are reminded this table as a symbol of God's radical welcome, where we remember the hospitality that Jesus offered as he shared so many meals with friends and enemies. 
with family and strangers, saints and sinners. We remember Jesus' words, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So today we come to this table as bold followers of Christ, and here we experience the invitation that we are called to share in the world. Let us pray. O God, teetering between known and unknowable, between life and death, between the threshold of symbol and sacrament, we remember Jesus' words, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. We long for your call of justice for all of creation, even while being paralyzed with fear that we aren't capable. We remember Jesus' words, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. We offer you thanks, creative and transformative God, for the gifts of this time together and the gifts of this simple meal. May we visualize your beloved community as we share in the bread and cup and covenant together to work for your realm. God of wheat, God of wine, God of bread, God of cup, meet us here as you constantly meet us in life's big and small moments. Remind us that our faith is embodied, lived and transformed in the most real of ways. So let us eat the bread that embodies our resurrection and our transformation. We eat the bread of new life. And let us drink the cup. We drink the cup of new life. And we say together, thanks be to God. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May you see God's face in all those you meet. Be the hands and feet of Christ in the world and know the love and power of spirit today and every day. Amen. See you next time.